play as I space pick. Okay, welcome everybody to our webinar live from Cyprus. Well, I'm in Cyprus uh, with ASI today, and all of our prominent guests are in their own residence. Uh, but that's the beautiful thing about, uh, about the internet. We can be anywhere in the world and still be together. Um, we are going to discuss some very important matters today with our guests. And uh, our theme basically is making your business less impactful on the environment and, and ways that the sommeliers and restaurants can be part of the solution. Uh, prioritizing sustainable selections on the wire on the wine list, touchless wine lists, uh, eliminating excessive packaging, wines, uh, packaging of wines and more. Uh, because on the heels of the COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland, we are proud to have assembled a number of the wine world leaders to talk about the road to carbon zero and ways in which we can all make our businesses le less impactful on the environment. We have an all-star cast today, virtually, <laughs> um, uh, from uh, sommeliers and general manager, uh, general retail manager for New Zealand wine merchant Maison Veron, Jeremy Ellis. Hi, Jeremy. We have founder and managing director of leading Belgian wine importer Gusto World, Christoph Heinen, master of wine. Hi, Christoph. Um, we have vice president in. in the National Marketing for California Wine Institute, Honor Comfort. Hi, Honor. Hi, everybody. Hi. And general manager and fifth generation of Spain's Familia Torres, Miguel Torres Macek, Masacek. Your name is just really hard to pronounce. I have been practicing, believe it or not. <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Um, and well, Net zero by 2050 is the goal, but is a whole easier said than done. And then there is the larger question of simply net zero enough. Um, each of our panelists represents a different aspect of the wine industry chain from growing to production to distribution. And our goal over the course of the next hour is to talk about concrete steps each of us can take to not only reach, but um, maybe even get beyond carbon zero. We will start by asking each person on the panel about his or her speciality and how, by working together, we can not only support, but also push each other towards a better and brighter future. And uh, let's uh, start in the vineyards. It's a common chestnut when we talk about what makes a good wine today. So let us start in the same place. Miguel Torres Machatec is a member of the fifth generation of the world-renowned Torres wine family in Spain. And you've been training both business and analogy. And like your father, Miguel Torres, um, or like your, your father, you actually support the family's vision of building a winery that is not only a leading business, but one with its vision squarely on reducing its impact on the environment. They are a vocal and unwavering in their dedication to environmental responsibility and sustainable, uh, the sustainability program. But when, and perhaps more importantly, why? Did family, Familia Torres set out on this journey to combat climate change? Um, well, Yora, it's a pleasure to be with you all. Thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, well, to, to answer to your question, uh, I have to say that uh, we realized this because uh, for a long time, and this is thanks to my father's experience, because I was very, you know, I was younger at those times, but thanks to my father's experience, he remember, you know, uh, how the harvest used to come much later, uh, some decades ago. And while well, the past years, the harvest were coming earlier and earlier. And one day, you know, we, uh, we went with all the family to the cinema to watch this uh, movie called The uh, Inconvenience Truth, no? where Al Gore was explaining about that. And then suddenly it was like, uh, you know, like a connection uh, with that idea, because finally we understood what was going on. I mean, we knew that something was happening, but we did not know what exactly was happening. No? And since that day, um, you know, we are family business and, and, uh, and we, we always want the next generation to be able to continue making wine. So since that day, we were really committed in order to reduce our carbon footprint. No? And uh, I remember at the beginning that uh, 
that we set an objective no, that from 2008 to 2020, we wanted to reduce our carbon footprint by 30%. But, uh, but to be honest, you know, uh, when we set this objective, we did not know how we were going to do it because we did not know which uh, were the technologies available. No? But it was a goal. And I think that this is very important for any winery, for any company to have a goal. No? And from that moment on, we, we start working. It's like a puzzle of different projects that we call them Torres and Earth. Uh, in order to reduce the carbon footprint, not only in the winery, but also from our suppliers and also from the transportation. No? Uh, so uh, I can say that uh, before already 2020, we achieved to reduce this 30% emissions. And now we are already setting the goal to go to 60% reduction compared to 2008. No? We, we hope we're going to work hard to do that before 2030. Sorry, so uh, one of the other things that also helped us a lot in this, uh, in this uh, work was uh, an association that, that we started called the International Wineries for Climate Action. This is an association that we started with the Jackson family in, uh, in the US. And we both realized that we, we had the same problems, we had the same challenges. And, um, and we wanted an, an association that really would allow wineries to join to, uh, to work on reducing the carbon footprint and, uh, and, not really, um, and not really a seal that just would talk about sustainability because a lot of people are talking about sustainability, but sometimes it's becoming like an empty war. No? You, you, uh, some, some people say I can plant some trees and that's it, no? but really the, the goal here is to reduce the carbon footprint. No? Um, this, this year, for example, what I can tell you is that uh, following this idea of the, of the reduction, we already have achieved to capture uh, carbon, the carbon dioxide that comes from the fermentation of the wines. And I'm telling you that because it's, uh, it's the first year that we achieved that, that, that we have set this technology that is a pioneer technology, at least in Spain. And, uh, and the idea is that we can produce wines uh, that during the fermentation, we can capture that carbon and we can use it uh, for uh, other purposes in the winery because it's an inner gas, right? Uh, just yesterday, we also started the, the first association of regenerative viticulture because many times when we talk about the carbon footprint, we talk about the wineries, right? But what happened with the vineyard? Well, uh, here in, in Spain, most of the vineyards that we have, they are certified organic viticulture. But uh, some, some time ago, and thanks to Alan Sabory, I discovered uh, something that is called holistic management and that it relates very, very much with how to regenerate the soils, right? For centuries, the soils of the vineyards all over, all over the world, they, they have been used and overused, right? So many times those soils have lost the capacity of storing carbon. So with the regenerative viticulture, and that means using the cover crop, so the soil has, has always to be covering green, working again with animals, doing certain techniques we are achieving to actually capture carbon again in the soils and to, and to bring back life to our soils, you know, which, is, which is very important. You know, I can tell you there are 7,400,000 hectares in the world. If we can turn all these soils into more alive soils, we're going to capture an amazing amount of carbon and, and wine will be a symbol of fighting against climate change. I think it's worth it to go for that. Wow, well, that's uh, that's uh, very ambitious, and uh, well, you already proved that you uh, have made some of your goals. So I have no doubt that you will be close in on uh, on achieving these as well. Uh, I've heard about your uh, initiative with the Jackson family previously, and it's just very very interesting. And uh, I'm really looking forward to following that uh, further on. We spoke to one of the other members earlier this year from Grahams, who was also a part of the initiative, and it is truly a very very interesting project. Okay. Let's uh, move on to distribution. Getting wine from the vineyard to the consumer represents one of the larger impacts of our industry on the environment. Uh, few understand that better than Christoph Heinen, Master of Wine. And uh, congratulations on your Master of Wine title, Christoph. Well deserved. Mm -hmm. um, but um, as a founder and managing director for the fully carbon neutral fine wine importer Gusta World, um, in Belgium, Christophe, how do you measure the impact of shipping when calculating your business carbon footprint? 
Does shipping distance ever become a factor in your decision making process, whether to represent a wine or not? Uh, and if not, which factors do most significantly influence your decision to represent an estate? Yeah, so first of all, thank you for having me on this uh, wonderful session with these uh, beautiful people around the world, and especially to talk about uh, uh, an issue which is really at the heart of the uh, philosophy that we have here in the company, something that is really uh, inscribed in the core of our values. And I think that's very important when talking about uh, carbon footprint and all the little uh, initiatives that we take to reduce it. It's not about greenwashing, it's about finding out in long term and doing little steps little by little, little changes just to move ahead and never be stopped or never be satisfied with what you're doing. So um, as far as we are concerned, we import about just under a million bottles uh, to this country and distribute it to a lot of uh, wine shops and, and restaurants and so on. And um, so the, the, the initial interest was to um, see how we could offset all our carbon uh, footprint and notably the one that involves uh, transport because we're more specialized in the, into importing wines from all over the world. So we import wines from New Zealand, from South America, South Africa, Canada, everywhere, Spain, Portugal. And so um, we, we, we did, a, I think it took about a year for us to do a complete study and Excel was our friend or Excel is our friend uh, <laughs> to find out how and how the flows essentially worked in the company and where the wines came from, how they were transported, through what type of transport they came in and what type of quantities they came in. And we, um, just like Miguel, we, we also had a, an objective was, first of all, was to reduce our, our carbon footprint by, by 30%, that was in 2018, in a five-year mark. And um, so basically what we do is, um, we use their uh, existing documents, official documents that set out the carbon footprint of each and every individual type of transport, types of boats, uh, distances, uh, trucks, uh, containers, uh, everything. And so we put all these in, we look at all the flows, all the purchase flows from where the uh, bottles depart uh, up to right here in the uh, warehouse. And then we just make these uh, very sophisticated calculations about what the impact is of each and every bottle. On top of that, of course, we look at all the energy flows within the company, how we uh, you know, deal with energy here in the company, heating, uh, cars, uh, deliveries, and so on. And so we look at how we could improve that, just not, not only compensating it. So, um, you know, obviously we're a trader, we're not a producer, so we just buy and sell. Um, that is what we do. So we, we, our impact is rather limited on that end, but I think we can do, um, you know, we can uh, do the best we can for the, for the future. As far as the decision process, well, let's be clear, we, we import wines from all over the world. So there is a carbon footprint for us. I mean, uh, there are very little local wines in Belgium, and it would not be viable for our company just to sell wines that are produced in Belgium to Belgian consumers. So we, we are part of the more globalized market. And um, if we want to continue in the long term to be part of that market without impacting or with a limited impact on uh, what is um, being done in terms of CO2 emissions, we, we have to take action. So. Um, we, of course, we look first at the quality of the products. That's the most important thing for us. Uh, I mean, uh, the uh, carbon footprint of the, um, of the wines are secondary, but we do take a, a look at how producers um, work around carbon emissions, uh, what type of, uh, what types of agri agricultural practices they have, what type of bottles that they use. Uh, I mean, we, we we refuse all types of samples that are sent by uh, polystyrene, uh, yeah, petrol made uh, boxes. Uh, we have solar panels, uh, we have uh, electric cars, uh, electric delivery. We, we, yes? What about heavy bottles? 
That's something well, that annoys me. Harry yeah. Potter is, uh, if I may quote someone, is a little bit the elephant uh, in front of the whole room. Yeah, you know. Um, in, indeed, I mean, uh, heavy bottles are not the best thing in terms of a carbon footprint for our industry. Um, and we, we do not favor heavy bottles here in the company. Um, but you have to look at more holistically, uh, as was previously mentioned, it's not only about the bottle, it's also about all the practices that are being done in terms of water saving. And we go even as so far here, we are in the process of um, doing what we call social responsibility where we look at not only our impact on the environment but our, our impact on humans how we pay our suppliers how we pay um, how our customers pay us how we act uh, in terms of social responsibility in the company so coming back to that bottle question yeah i think it's not great to have heavy bottles and they're certainly very impactful in, in terms of co2 production and it's mostly about how the bottles are essentially produced. So, but we're, as we said in the beginning, we're in the fine wine business. So it's quite, and this is a very traditional business. So it's very hard to, um, us as a small uh, independent importer to influence uh, consumers or sommeliers, uh, high-end sommeliers to serve wines in bag and box. I, I doubt that we'll be in the short term be able to do that even in, uh, cans or pet or whatever other um, options there are that are more sustainable in terms of uh, CO2 um, impact. So uh, quality remains the first aspect, but as I said, we all, all also look at the um, at what our producers are doing in our vineyards. And we also have regular newsletters, which we send out to the producers, uh, just always questioning them and um, trying for them to get into this habit of doing little things. Far from us, the idea of imposing anything on anyone in the vineyards, we are just intermediaries. We are not involved in the labor of, you know, uh, producing grapes for the production of wine every day. You know, that's very, very hard uh, in particular because of the climate change right now. So, but we just, we just really cherish very much little initiatives that anyone takes to offset a little bit of, uh, CO2, but it's a very complex and very difficult subject. Yeah, in a in a very wet year for some of the northern um, vineyards in 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 France or elsewhere, uh, like 2021. Uh, if you're an organic producer or a bio biodynamic producer, well, then you spend a lot of time in your vineyards on the tractor, spraying copper, sulfur, copper, sulfur, copper, sulfur, just because of the climatic elements of uh, rain and and the danger and of course every time you go out in the tractor well you have this impact on your co2 and sulfur is also one of the elements that impacts quite um, dramatically on co2 so it's never uh it's never very very easy to just say oh this is good this is bad this is this this is that i think that for us as importers it takes little step and I think that, um, I, I, and I wish at least that in the Sommelier community, uh, Sommelier start thinking about these little elements just a little bit in a broader term than just, is this organic biodynamic? Is this produced this or that, or is it natural, uh, whatever, but just go a little bit beyond that and, and look at how they can, um, you know, offset or reduce the uh, CO2 consumption in their own restaurants. Well, we'll be um, going on to Jeremy in a little moment and ask him about things like that, exactly. But before that, um, education is very important. And like you mentioned, Christoph, actually, you said, well, we send our, our producers newsletters with small suggestions, maybe. But um, the next step, like I said, is educating those hands that will ultima ultimately deliver the wine where it needs to go. Uh, sommeliers are the gatekeepers. Uh, Jeremy, that's you basically here today. Uh, the direct links between markers and wine drinkers. But Honor Comfort is the vice president of international marketing for California Wines. And in 2021, California Wines launched uh, Capstone California, a comprehensive trade education platform and certification program dedicated to en engage the international wine trade through education on all aspects of the California wine industry. Um, 
I've heard so much great things about this program. I have several friends who are very much engaged in it, and I'd like to take part in it myself at some point. But, um, Honor, you've said that the first and most important step is for sommeliers to be educated about sustainable wine growing and winemaking practices themselves. Mm -hmm. How much of a responsibility should it be for the individual regions to make sustainability and stewardship um, of a region's wineries a focus of organized education, you think? What success think, have you seen with Capstone so far? Oh, great. Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to step yeah, no, on what no. you said. Uh, I'm just so enthusiastic about this topic that I was eager to comment. Uh, first of all, thank you, Liara, for inviting us. And um, it really is an honor, truly, to be on this panel with um, such distinguished partners. So thank you. And also to speak to your international audience of sommeliers. We are so thrilled to be a part of this. And, and I truly do believe that sommeliers are a key part of this link of what we're trying to do. Christophe, I loved what you said about all of these little tiny steps that we all need to take. And this truly is a journey of millions and millions of steps all around the world. And that we're all working together to try to find our way, try, try to find our way through it. But back to your question, Leora, I think it is absolutely the responsible responsibility of a region and a regional association like uh, California Wines to educate our partners on what we are doing and what we have been doing for more than 20 years in order to focus on developing sustainable practices in the vineyard and, um, and climate smart practices leading towards healthy soils water conservation, developing our communities and our staff and sharing with our partners. Um, it's, while it's easy in one sense to say to sommeliers, well, just choose sustainable wines to share with your customers. That's not always easy. Christoph is a great partner in terms of working hard to make that information available. But as a region, we also need to recognize our role in that. And not only making, uh, not only collecting the information and leading in terms of our wineries and our growers, but also making that information easily accessible to sommeliers and to the whole international wine community. And we recognize the, the, the challenge and the pressure in terms of education and information. Uh, one of the, the things that I always say about wine is that wine is for naturally curious people because there's always more to learn. It's one of the things I love about it, but it's also one of our challenges is that we're constantly needing to learn. So I see our responsibility to first off, understand our audience, what their needs are, and then work hard to develop a means for us to share detailed and thorough information. So capstonecalifornia.com is our new wine education platform, as well as the professional certification program. And it's designed to be not just a one-way street in terms of an individual working their way through to develop their knowledge of California wines, but it's designed to create essentially a network. Our goal is to help train wine professionals to then be able to share that information with their customers and also to lead and help train other wine professionals and develop the, um, a network of well-informed and well-educated professionals who can share the story of California from the ground up, literally. And at the same time, we have a partner website, which is CaliforniaSustainableWine.com. And that truly is the hub for information about California's approach to wine growing and winemaking. And currently, more than 50% of all of the vineyards in California are certified under one um, or, or more sustainable certification programs. And... Um, more than 80% of our wines are produced in certified sustainable wineries. All of the information behind that, what that means, what the components are of those programs, how this leads to, a, it's built upon a process of continuous improvement. That's one of the most essential pieces of what we're doing. That's all readily available and easily accessible. And so our job is to work hard to help make this process of choice and education and then sharing the information with consumers with the with the wine drinkers themselves 
to make that easy and a part of a sommelier's um, everyday operation. So we work closely. It's, it's actually one of the reasons why we've chosen to work closely with, uh, with Azi um, on a global scale in order to in turn get feedback from our sommelier partners so that we can continue to learn and be able to share information more readily. Well spoken. Uh, I think that transparency is super important. And just like you say, uh, honor that. I mean, I think that today in today's society, transparency is more important than ever. And especially when it comes to the environment and what we're doing about it. And that it's not just words and uh, that it just needs action. Like, like you also mentioned, Miguel. Uh, and, uh, and well, we are in Cyprus, as I mentioned, the uh, best sommelier of Europe and Africa is currently going on. The candidates started today uh, with their tests. I have no idea if they were anything about the environment or, or uh, whatsoever, but um, we need to speak to a sommelier and Jeremy. Uh, finally, the wine has reached the capable, informed hands of its distributor. Uh, it is ready for its ultimate destination, the consumer. Who better to illustrate that than sommelier and general retail manager from, for New Zealand wine merchant Maison Voron, Jeremy Ellis. Given the wine list need to include a broad spectrum of wines, uh, what advice would you give to sommeliers looking for looking to reduce the like um, carbon footprint of their wine program? Which factors like farming practices, closure, packaging have the greatest impact in your opinion? Well, first of all, uh, I'd like to say thank you for for inviting me into this. I, I feel like a bit of a minnow amongst whales here. This is a, a really special uh, group to be included in. So, thank you. Um, this is a topic that is very close to my heart, and particularly people in New Zealand, uh, where, where we see ourselves as green, but like many countries around the world, there are a lot of challenges. Uh, working in, in restaurants, and I've worked in everything from large-scale commercial through to smaller, and my current role, where we mostly sell French wines, uh, is, is quite challenging uh, to identify true carbon practices or uh, stories, and, and I guess I sort of reiterate the story of everyone here today. I believe the role of a, of a sommelier is really to, to educate and communicate, and that's communicate both ways. So it's about communicating to the client and communicating to our, our partners, our, our suppliers, our wine producers, and letting them know what practices are working on as well. It's also a little bit about holding both parties to account in some ways. Um, one of the things in talking about carbon uh, in the production of rosé, for example, the use of chilling to, re to uh, reduce the colour within it has no real effect on the flavour, but is a massive trend internationally now that you drink paler rosés and it's causing a huge impact in the south of France with power consumption. Being aware of these stories and communicating them to clients to inform them and help them make those, those careful choices or supporting suppliers like Torres who are making solid efforts in those areas is very, very important. Within the restaurant or, or uh, dining environment, there, there are other things that you can look at from things like, you know, reusable lights or, or sustainable light systems and so on. The big one for me, I think, uh, working in New Zealand is, is transportation. Uh, as Christoph was saying earlier, yes, Belgium uh, has a bit of issues with, um, you know, getting New Zealand and probably Australian wine to Belgium for distribution. We pretty much have to import everything. And that includes the bottles and the corks and the Stelvin caps. So there's always a, a much larger challenge when we look at these things. The nice thing is being in a smaller uh, community in a smaller industry, everyone does have a very strong relationship with each other. And you can find out the truth behind how these, these suppliers are operating. Uh, many suppliers in New Zealand uh, are very proud of the stories that they talk about. So they do talk about um, native forest replanting as a way of carbon offset, uh, using animals within the, in the uh, vineyards. The reality is people don't realise New Zealand's wine industry is actually very small. Uh, you know, we've got just over 2,000 uh, growers and, and winemakers in New Zealand. Um, but when you look at that as a scale, four of them make up about 80% of the production of New Zealand. So, so the other 2,000 or so are filled by a small group. When you're looking from the Somalia sense and, and, and sort of working out this maze, uh, the most important thing I think is those relationships. 
um, and, and making sensible choices, being aware of it and communicating is going to have the broadest impact long term because it's the client who actually ends up deciding what wine they're going to buy. And uh, as mentioned earlier, the flash pa packaging of large bottles is, is not particularly conducive to carbon um, in, in, in uh, shipping or, or in production. Within the restaurant itself, uh, you know, you, you can talk about uh, making sure that you've got self-closing fridges and those sorts of things, uh, looking at alternative power sources if it's available to you. In New Zealand, we're, we're quite lucky. Um, uh, about 85% of our power in an average year is hydro. Uh, and in drought years, that does drop a little bit to about 70%. Uh, there's about 15% through other sustainable options, and then we have about 10 to 15% coal in a bad year, as low as 8% uh, in, 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 in a good year. So we're a little bit luckier in New Zealand with our, with our uh, energy production, so we can probably be a little bit, I wouldn't say lax, but more relaxed about some of those issues that might be facing other, other groups around the world. I think one of the things is is that there is no, as as Stefan was mentioning earlier, there is no one solution fits all. We you really need to look at the nuanced places and 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 the environments within locales that you're in. If you're in California, the challenges that you face versus being in Australia or Belgium or or Spain or New Zealand are, are going to be broadly different. And and the SOM's role is to make sure that they are aware of the challenges that exist in their community and in their environment. If they are not really aware of that, they can't tell the story, be that around heritage, pedigree, providence, quality. They can't really tell that story truly. And, and one of the things that I think that is often forgotten about is passing on the true cost of a product to customers. If, if a bottle has come all the way from Australia and you can list it at X price, but that X price excludes the fact that it produces 1.25 kilos of carbon, that single bottle, because of shipping, if that cost isn't mitigated in some way, then you are in truth ignoring the fact around carbon emissions. And as a song, you've got to be honest with yourself about that. There are other discussions around things like, you know, electronic wine lists as a way of saving paper production, but but the counter to my to my thought on that has always been, well, you've got to import that from somewhere, unless you're lucky enough to live in a country that actually makes it. And in New Zealand, we have a lot of trees that we use for the production of paper. So for us, producing paper is actually not a bad way of mitigating carbon cost. Um, I don't think it's perfect by any way, but it's a, it's a small solutionary step. Understanding those those you know multiple different solutions, looking at things like stemware, where you're getting your glasses, your crockery, uh, the things that you can influence, and who you're choosing as your big partners. In New Zealand, uh, both Constellation and Pernod Ricard have a, have a large influence within New Zealand, uh, and wine lists. Um, they you know they're an important part of of our industry. Their commitment to uh, local. Uh, carbon dioxide uh, mitigation might not be as much as, say, some of the locals. This is because they're having to develop policies that are internationally run. And so that can be a, a real challenge if they are a major partner with your restaurant, ensuring that you're getting that story through and communicating that bias is a difficult challenge for any sommelier to do. So for me, it really comes down to that, that relationship that communication, as, as all of the other people here have said today, and also making sure that you're up to date with what technology is available to mitigate it as much as possible. Self-closing fridge doors, fairly simple, but they can save up to 12% on your power bill in a week. Now, if it's being saved in your power bill, it's being saved in carbon. So it's about knowledge and about communication, in my, in my opinion. Well, I think that if every sommelier was as, uh, as uh, educated as you are on the carbon footprints of, of all manner of aspects in the wine industry, we would uh, probably be able to reduce things quite much faster. So I think you have a big job too, Jeremy. 
<laughs> on educating your fellow psalms. <laughs> um, I uh, have um, a few other topics I would like us to cover um, in terms, well, also on transportation, production, packaging and education, but I'll be throwing out a few questions here and uh, I'd like you all to, to feel free to answer and uh, let's see if we get some some um, some good interaction of these questions. So let's start with this one. Wine is at its core an agricultural industry, basically, and we are all dependent on the environment. And there's been a lot of talk in recent times that simply achieving carbon neutrality isn't enough to offset the devastation of forest fires, floods, high temperatures, and extreme weather we've all experienced. What, in your opinion, are places where we can get beyond carbon neutral and work toward climate positive solutions? Anyone? Miguel, let's start with you. Well, you know, I, I like very much your question because this is something that, that we, this uh, question, we thought about this uh, some years ago, no? Uh, yeah, from a winery point of view, uh, you, you can really, get very close to uh, carbon neutrality, you are, you are always going to have, you know, certain emissions that you can compensate, you can plant uh, forests, no, but, but still, there's a lot of things that you can do in the winery, you, you can work like as we do with photovoltaic panels, with uh, biomass boiler, with geothermal energy, uh, with uh, solar panels also that are different. So there, there are many things that, that you can do to reduce the carbon footprint, no. But don't forget about something, okay? Most of the wineries, they also have vineyards, okay? For many, many years, we have been tilting the soils with, uh, with, with these plows and with this tractor. And every time that we till the soil, uh, and I know that our parents told us, you have to till the soils to, to have a good production or, or our grandparents, no? But the truth is that our grandparents had no idea about climate change, right? And this is what we are having now. Every time that we till the soil, we release the carbon that is in our soils back to the atmosphere, okay? We can do the opposite. We can regenerate the soil and take the carbon dioxide that has been emitted by the fossil fuels and bring them back to the soils. And this is thanks to the vineyards, uh, thanks to the cover crop, uh, thanks to uh, not tilting, not plowing, okay? This is not something that you can do from one day to uh, another, okay? It takes between five and 10 years to regenerate the vineyard. But honestly, I cannot think about the, about the most uh, challenging, but at the same time, you know, great project that we can do. We can all turn our vineyards into a place where we can store carbon. That'll be fantastic. I totally agree. And it's just, Recently, I've been discussing this exact thing with uh, with another MW actually, who has also had strong opinions on not tilting the soils and keeping all its nutrients inside. Uh, is there anyone else who'd like to comment on this uh, on this question, Christoph or yeah, Jeremy? No. Whatever, I can I can go ahead. Yeah, thank okay. you. Uh, I think I think there's a, an interesting study actually uh, done in Cyprus uh, where you're right now on actually. Uh, CO2 sequestration in the vineyards and the organic matter and the importance of organic matter in the soil to sequestrate and to get that CO2. So I think that referring back to what Miguel said, I think that um, there are really a lot of good vineyard practices which can be put in place over the long term to uh, get that CO2 back in the soil. And I think we are all um, very, very much sensitive to these elements, especially in the fine wine sector. I think we can go over the simple brand, uh, label, history, and all of that. And I think we can move on now and, and see that there are a lot of really great wines in the world. And these practices are hugely important. I'm not a big fan, and I don't know how sustainable, really, really low end, mass-produced um, grapes and wines are. Uh, I think uh, I think in the long term, uh, a lot of agricultural goods uh, may have to be produced in a more um, respectful way. And that will include probably or impact probably their prices. But again, I think so that vineyard practices are probably very important with the rest that Miguel said. So Jeremy, you go ahead, please. Thank you, Christoph. Um, one, one of the things, and, and this goes back to what Miguel was talking about, uh, in New Zealand, a number of wineries have started, uh, wineries and vineyards have started moving towards looking at how they can uh, utilize 
um, uh, animals in the vineyard as a way of mitigating uh, the use of tractors and herbicides and pesticides. Uh, there's a, a particular winery in New Zealand called Yeelands that uses a, a baby doll sheep that they release into the vineyards and they, they don't grow past about two and a half feet. Initially, they thought it was just a great way for cutting the, uh, helping with a bit of canopy management, keeping the weeds down a little bit and that sort of thing. What they discovered over time, though, was that the urea, urea uh, going into the soil and the constant trampling down of the grass actually built up a small sod level that held about 50% more carbon than they expected. In combination with this, Yearlands also developed um, uh, wetlands, uh, redeveloped wetlands. What's not well known about New Zealand is 150 years ago, we were covered mostly in, in beechwood uh, forests and, and kauri, which is a hard timber. Uh, and in the last 150 years, a lot of that has been removed. And, and when you look at most of the uh, viticultural areas in New Zealand, they were covered at one point in native forest. So um, it's been quite a, a big change. And so some of the soil issues that Miguel was referring to uh, that are occurring in Europe are actually happening even faster in New Zealand. And so there's been an active uh, movement amongst most of the industry to, to combat that. And uh, this keeping carbon uh, into, the, into the ground. And I guess it also ties up with biodynamics and organics to some extent, because you get much more biodiversity in the soil bacteriums. Uh, and that allows for uh, better uh, CO2 and water retention. That's the other thing that they're discovering is water retention. Um, if you have uh, low CO2 in your soil, you don't maintain moisture in the soil um, because it's the CO2 that keeps it in the soil. Uh, so th there are a number of challenges that, that many wineries in New Zealand have done. And uh, probably the best and, and earliest example, New Zealand started going self-sustainable on water since 1996. And currently there are only 4% of vineyards in New Zealand that don't have full sustainability. They've all been planted in the last five years. Um, Huia, however, was one of the first to go full uh, emissions zero, so full carbon neutral uh, in terms of their emissions. Now, they released their first report in 2007 and 2008. Um, and interestingly, the biggest single cost was not transportation and it wasn't freight. It was packaging. Hands down, packaging was it makes up almost 50 percent of their cost. So they started looking at, at, um, at carbon cost. They started looking at ways they could mitigate that. And one of the things was looking at advanced recycling of glass. Uh, for every 10% of, of recycled glass you use, you, you drop your carbon emissions by about two to 3% in the end product. So if you can get 100% recycled glass into your, and it might be, not be practical for everyone, but uh, they're now working at 90% recycled glass. So they've dropped another 18% or so of their carbon emissions out through that. They used to pay for carbon credits. I was speaking with uh, their brand manager last year. They only do that in really tough years now. They don't have to buy carbon credits at all to offset. Um, and they're 100% carbon neutral. Now, it's, it's part of a program. It's not a single solution, but it's part of a program. And, and I think I agree with Miguel. While you can look at the technology of things like recycled glass and, and, and better ways of doing it, the big one is most of your land is sitting there to be utilized as a carbon sink. And if you do it carefully, you can actually create better biodiversity in your soil, which will produce longer vigor in the vines in a healthy way. So for me, it's that combination of those two factors. Le Leora, I just wanted yeah. to make a, a comment it's a, um, that reinforces a lot of what my colleagues have said, but it provides a, an additional aspect to it, I think, that's hugely important, which is that while it's critical that we all look, we all start with ourselves or our individual businesses and what we can do. And of course, from a vineyard perspective, yes, healthy soils is essential, but also at the same time is water, uh, water conservation, water reuse, renewable energy sources, all of those approaches, plus then looking at the other aspects of, of our business. But then as soon as we are in that process and moving towards, uh, uh, towards our individual goals, we then need to look at our partners 
and who we're working with and how we can influence not only the vendors and the partners that we choose to work with, but then as a group, how we can align, collaborate and influence the larger realm. This is a, as we all know, it's a global issue. Our focus is not just on saving ourselves, it's on saving the planet. And so it's a little challenging to start thinking about being climate positive when our total goal is for the entire planet to become carbon neutral um, so that we can um, so that we can continue to go forward. But yes, as, as, as we work on ourselves, advancing beyond just being neut beyond uh, neutrality towards improvement on an individual basis helps offset in other parts of the world. We all recognize that, but I do think that that's, that that's essential. I also think that it's critical when we look at, um, as, as sommeliers, as wine professionals that are um, central to this whole process of sharing, gathering information, sharing information with our customers, that um, recognizing the, the, the impact and the relationship between different wine regions. And our business is a global one, and it always will be. That's the beauty of, of what we love. Wine from all these different places is interesting, distinctive, and unique. Our mission in this is to try to ensure that we can continue to share and enjoy wines around the world. So evaluating all of our different alternatives that we have. I love the fact that the packaging conversation came up and I hope that we can get back into that. I have some very specific thoughts on that, but in, at, at the same time, um, I think recognizing the important role that many of our leaders have played in advancing this from the perspective of California, we're the fourth largest wine region in the world, um, just as a state uh, within the US. And um, as California, we have always taken our commitment to the environment very, very seriously. We've led on many initiatives uh, for decades. We started this process of investing in our viticulture and advancing a comprehensive and holistic system of, of improving our soils, our water, um, natural um, and integrated pest management, which is essential, um, load and no tillage, all of these aspects. We've been working on this for 20 years can, and continue to do so every year to learn more and to share the share the knowledge, help growers adapt, work on cost mitigation of these processes, which is essential. And I'm so glad that you brought that up, both Jeremy and Christoph. Um, and so that the, the whole um, taking the approach that it is, it's people, planet, and partners all working together. But that's, I think, where we're going to hopefully get to this point. So thank you. Well, Thank you, Honor, and um, I think this is this is great because we well we were we had another like six questions. I think we we're going to fast forward a little bit because we're running out of time. But I want to get back to the packaging because I thought what you started, Jeremy, was very interesting, and you follow followed up, Honor. Um, so for we have a question here on packaging, which kind of is the elephant in the room, I guess. We need a way to get the wine safely from the vineyard to the customers. Yet container and closure together constitute perhaps the largest impact of wine on the environment like we've been talking about already today but what are concrete alternatives and approaches that psalms can seek out to reduce that impact and i'd like to hear from, from all of you your perspective on this actually not only jeremy as a psalm but uh you christoph as as basically as you're importing these wines and and miguel what what is your winery doing in in this aspect to reduce uh, emission on on packaging. Oh. Yeah, Jeremy. Well, I, you know, it, it's a very challenging question. I mean, the the, the reality is uh, packaging's tough because it's designed to sell the product. At the end of the day, when you you know go and buy a, a flash first growth Bordeaux, if it came in a squinty little frail bottle, you'd be a little bit worried and probably wouldn't purchase it. Um, it, it is a challenge and it is a balance. 
And I, and I think when you're looking at it, uh, you know, like I just talked about recycling as, a, a, you know, if you're using recycled glass, how much less carbon that then uses. It, it's about understanding the technologies that can be utilized, not only to mitigate, but reduce and, and, and have an impact uh, that also can also be told a story about. Um, the, the classic example at the moment, I've just done all of the on premier 2018s in the last two months at, at Maison. And, and a lot of these bottles are, are big, heavy, thick uh, bottles. Uh, I, I don't want to think about what our carbon impact was, to be honest. It was a bit terrifying unloading some of these uh, containers. Um, but the other, the other side of that is uh, a lot of the producers that we're dealing with are using um, uh, low carbon emission, uh, are focusing on, on the things like Miguel was talking about in the vineyard, are working very hard towards the carbon uh, practices that are beneficial long term for, for the world. The challenge is about communicating it to the to the client all the way through, and and uh, just to give you an idea, I know you mentioned that that um, uh, you know packaging is the big one. Uh, I've actually got statistics here for CO two output uh, per bottle for Australian wine uh, being shipped to the UK. The single biggest impact is actually the production of the wine grapes themselves at one point oh five kilos of the about 1.25 kilos of carbon produced per bottle. And that's because it makes up the majority of the weight when it's shipped, right? So the actual shipping of the juice is part of the problem. And, and I don't think we'll ever be able to mitigate that uh, unless people decide they want to drink less, which I hope they don't, because I think they'll be missing out. But um, the, the reality is we have to look at ways of mitigating, I mean, packaging, it's going, there's only so small you can make the bottles. There's only so few ways you can do closures. People talk about shipping wine in bulk. Australia does a lot of that to Hong Kong. But the reality is we have to look at the ways we can offset it within our vineyards because there is a practicality to it that must be applied first. If I can't get the drink into the customer's hands, then the wine might not be as well and be made. You know, you, you might as well forget about making it. And that's where I think the challenge is. It's that balance uh, and, and, and understanding that if you've done everything you can to reduce the weight of the bottle, the, the uh, recycled paper, everything that you can in that process, then there isn't a lot more you can do at this time. And unless there's some revolutionary technology coming out that I'm not aware of, which is quite possible, um, I, I wouldn't really have much more of an answer to that. Well, I have a question then. Let me just give you an example. Um, I come from Norway and in Norway we have a monopoly situation and the monopoly has, well, I'm sure uh, at least uh, Miguel, you are familiar with this and maybe Honor as well, um, but um, the monopoly has gone out and said that they are trying to reach certain goals within a certain amount of time and they are going to do it by uh, requesting bottles that are either uh, by recycled glass or actually uh, the lightweight glass and even the bottles of the, the plastic, the PET bottles. So just throwing out a question for fun here within the last five minutes, would it be a possibility for, for larger producers like, like Torres and like some of the very large producers in California to to maybe do some other most selling wines uh, to change their packaging for at least those wines and then keep the regular packaging for the fine wines. Will that help? How, how, how much would that help? Lyra, I'd love to comment on this. And I, I think, um, yes, it will all help. And yes, we need to look at all options. All options are on the table at this point, and I think that that's essential. Um, alternative packaging is a major focus within California. There's a huge amount of exploration and experimentation. For example, I was just speaking with Steve Mathiason, who's one of the leaders within our community around sustainable wine growing. He was in the process of testing a new bottle that was actually glass-lined PET. Really interesting. 
and very lightweight, but intended to ensure to protect the quality. And it's always striking that balance between the quality, of course, as well as how we manage the shipping. However, I think it's essential that we recognize that our international wine community um, plays a, a critical role in this with sommeliers. And for me, I believe that as an industry, we need to work hard to educate consumers and break the paradigm that weight equals quality when it comes to glass bottles. I think that's essential and that is our job. Part of this is for us to do research to better understand consumer perception and how we can communicate with them effectively. Part of it is sharing with them the, the information about packaging. Part of it is choosing, making the choice to share wines that, have, that do use lightweight glass some of whom have been using white, white light weight glass for decades um, at the very high end of the quality scale. So there's, there's no one simple answer to this, but I do see our partners um, in terms of helping to tell the story, Jeremy, as you said, educate consumers, and let's, let's not equate heavy glass with quality as we go forward. Yeah, uh, I think you're, oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I would like to comment and also following with what uh, Jeremy said. You know, the importance of reducing the weight of the bottles. Uh, that also one or um, comment here. Uh, I can say that, for example, uh, we are starting to ship and bottle in Canada. Okay, so uh, this is something that some years ago would be unthinkable. But if you look at the carbon footprint, you know, like it. For certain kind of wines, of course, I'm not going to do this with a Masla Plana, right? But uh, but I can do it for wines that are more for daily consumption. And look, my great great grandparents they used to ship the wines in oak barrels, right? And they and they were going to Cuba or to Latin America, right? So why why cannot do that with the modern technology for certain kind of wines, no? And at the end, I also would like to comment here in Catalonia, in Spain, we are doing a test about how to reuse the bottles, okay? It's not recycle the bottle, it's to reuse the bottle, no? Because if you think uh, carefully, you know, in the wine industry, uh, we mainly use three shapes of bottles, no? Is the Burgundy, the Bordeaux bottle, and then maybe the Rhin, and maybe you can put another one, no? Why we can all, not all find an agreement to use all these bottles so that we don't have to destroy them and use more energy to make a new bottle? You know, this is this is something that we can you do is is part of our decision, right? So I think I think you're absolutely right, and I also think what you just said is very very important. You said a few years ago it was unthinkable, but exactly. I think we need to forget unthinkable because everything was unthinkable before. What we do today was un unthinkable five, ten, fifteen, twenty years ago. Uh, so we just need to embrace what the possibilities are i think and all the way at the end i would just wanted to ask christoph if you have a, a short short comment at the end also on this subject before uh, we uh, just just want to say that i perfectly agree and i think there is going to be regulation in place that are that is going to come in the more mature countries where the governments are surely uh, going to put taxes they love taxes taxes into place for uh, heavier for weight. This is already the case in some markets like Switzerland, as you know, there is an import tax that is based on the weight. So I think, uh, you know, if we don't do something about it, there will be certainly regulations coming in. So, but I, I agree with Miguel, I think we could go to a more standardized uh, bottling. And uh, I, I make a suggestions for some years also pouring by the glass, uh, I think using Magnum bottles is probably more interesting than using just uh, regular bottles. There you go. That was my little end comment on that one. Well, thank Leo. you very much, uh, Christoph. And, and on that comment, I just wanted to say that I actually had some Masla Plana from a Magnum 2016 yesterday with a fabulous uh, barbecue dinner here in Cyprus. And we'll have some uh, delicious California wines also today, I suppose. So that's going to be nice. Thank you all so much for taking the time to join us and offering your experiences and insight. It's been 
tremendously interesting also for myself and i see that people are commenting and sharing on our facebook uh, feed as well um so for everyone who's been watching be sure to keep an eye on our social media channels as we will talking uh we'll be talking uh, uh throughout the month about ways uh, ways in which psalms can re reduce their own carbon footprint on and off the floor so for december month we always do a little tease at the end of each webinar because in december it's time to celebrate <laughs> our word for celebrating for our final webinar of the year we are ready to recap 2021 with a glass in hand and an incredible hour of some filled fun with the best and brightest from around the world tune in with guests that include heidi mckinnon master wine from finland jeff tome from mauritius london-based jeff jan konetsky representing germany and canada's very own veronique rivet so thank you again, everyone, for tuning in. And if you joined us late, don't worry, you will be able to see the whole thing again, either on Facebook on, or on YouTube, uh, ASI's YouTube channel. And also make sure that you do follow us in social media this week as we are in Cyprus with the best of Europe, Europe and the Africa's going on. So by Friday afternoon, European time, there will be a new European and African champion. Thank you all so much and have a lovely day.